I actually think I hear a police car and the noon whistle here, so uh, without uh, any further delay, I want to say that I'm Steve Larson, uh, one of the editors here at uh, Horde Dairyman Magazine, and we uh, welcome all of you that are with us today. It's a nice uh, list of attendees, and it's growing here by the, by the second, literally. Uh, we are glad that you're with us today with uh, uh, presenter Dan Undersander at the University of Wisconsin, very well-known agronomist, and uh, his topic is going to be sorting through cropping strategies, and we all know that there are some challenges uh, of various kinds because of the, of the past year we've had. The sponsor today is uh, Muriel and their bestinclassdairies.com program. And of course, as always, we're very pleased to have our co-host Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois with us today. There's also his sidekick Jim Baltz down there who uh, is the man uh, behind the controls that makes this all work. So, Mike, with that, I will uh, turn control over to you and let you introduce Dan and get us off and running. Well, very good, uh, Steve. Thanks very much. And we are excited uh, again to come back uh, to our participants with our, our, our monthly Hordes Dairyman webinar. And we have a very timely topic, as many of us in the U.S. are facing questions, not only here in the U.S., but in Canada and other places as well, with, with certainly a tough summer as far as that goes. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Dan Undersander as our official presenter. Dan grew up on a dairy farm in uh, central Minnesota, uh, got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota, his master's and Ph.D. at uh, Purdue University. Uh, I'm not sure, Dan, if we are going to beat you next Saturday or not, but uh, it's our last chance for Illinois to win a football game. Dan has got a national and international reputation. Uh, he, he conducts uh, meetings all across the United States. He spent 10 years at Texas A&M on, on their uh, forage research staff, and then the last 24 years he's a badger at the University of Wisconsin working in the Extension and Research and Forage Agronomist. And he has uh, spoken in a number of countries in North and South America and Eastern Europe. Uh, he has written over 1,200 articles in popular press and research areas. He uh, has one of the most aggressive uh, forage testing uh, programs here in the U.S. That's uh, envy of all of us in extension from that aspect. And he's heavily involved in, in uh, forage production, pasture management, forage varieties, and co-chairs their team. So Dan, without any further ado, we are so excited and pleased to have you on board to having the number one forage agronomist uh, tell us a little about what to look for here in 2013. Dan, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, I uh, am pleased to be here with the group and to be able to uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we are with forages. As a few of us were talking before this program started, we certainly know that we're short all over. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about why that happened. Uh, some farmers uh, planted some things this fall to look at what they might do to improve their tonnage, and we might talk about what probably was a good idea or what was a less good idea. And then we'll end by talking about what we can do to help us get uh, both through the winter and uh, into next spring as we start out. I think clearly an awful lot of the dairy region is going to be short on forage as we approach first cutting next spring and, and we'll need to manage very carefully. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what happened this last year first. Um, it's important to recognize that when alfalfa is cut or when it enters the winter, the roots die back. Uh, the root system is, is never constant. It's always changing. It's either getting bigger and growing and getting bigger or dying back and getting smaller. And so uh, the roots die back when we enter the winter. The roots die back uh, whenever we cut alfalfa. And then they must regrow ahead of the uh, next crop for the high yield good soil moisture is needed for this regrowth and and so last year in March we were dry and I knew at that point that we were going to have generally reduced yields on first cutting because even though we got a lot of rain in April and May we uh, can't make up for that lack of root growth that occurred in March and therefore yield was down. The same thing though happens after cutting. <clears throat> And we saw that this fall in many cases, where um, when we cut alfalfa, we mainly need rain, well, preferably at the time we cut to have a good level of soil moisture, but we need that for regrowth of those roots during the first two weeks. If we don't have that, we're going to have a reduced yield, even if we get plenty of rain the last two weeks of a four-week cycle. 
So the first question I wanted to ask is uh, how widespread was this uh, drought effect on first cutting this past year? Um, <clears throat> did you see uh, a 25 percent reduction or more in first cutting yield? Uh, zero to 25, no reduction or better than average? Very good, Dan. We're, we're off and running here. The, the polls are now opening, and it looks like we have a lot of Democrats because they're voting early and voting often at uh, at this stage of the game. We've got uh, well in excess of 50 people who can vote on this, and uh, and we're we're kind of uh, we're kind of stuck at about 33 percent. And uh, the polls uh, we are open now for uh, we one early. Dan, we give them about 45 seconds. Uh, we must have a bunch of Republicans from someplace in here because it's pretty slow going here at this point here we'll uh, give them another 10 seconds here right. vote come on folks let's vote yeah. we uh, vote uh, being one of the uh, organizers here our leaders but i would say that our crop here was probably between 0 and 25% first cutting off here here at the horse dairyman farm mike Okay, well, let's uh, go ahead and close this off if we can, and uh, and uh, we will show the results. And uh, Dan, we'll let you talk about them. Uh, it looks like uh, there there was almost a majority there at uh, zero to twenty five percent. Okay, so so that's good. That uh, again, it it varied by region. Uh, those that had some rain early, but the point was, is first cutting first was not a an outstanding yield in spite of the warm spring, the good growing conditions. Uh, and <clears throat> if anything, it was a little bit below average. Uh, this was one of the things that um, really kind of hurt us because remember we would normally expect 40% of our alfalfa yield to be in first cutting. And that's also, of course, the one that fills the bunkers and the silos and is the high quality for our dairy. So uh, we were kind of starting off the year on um, average to less than average as we went ahead. So generally that uh, first cutting was a little below average. The other thing that happened in a lot of the region was that uh, we had some drought this summer. A lot of us got some rain in early August. Uh, I was hoping that that would continue, that we could get a late fall growth, but generally across the region that didn't happen. So um, we had those three combinations of things that I think it's important to recognize. Uh, we had uh, average to below average first cutting, we had a dry summer with reduced alfalfa yield, and then we had uh, very little fall growth. And I might say that uh, the same thing happened for grasses as we looked around. <clears throat> and uh, actually grasses don't have the drought tolerance of alfalfa, so they tended to suffer larger yield reductions from the drought. And then uh, Actually, in some cases, we're going to see this spring that some cases the pastures it died out, and we will have to reseed as as we go into this next year. Uh, just a couple comments about water use in in crops generally, and, and including alfalfa. Um, the water needs of a crop depend on the temperature and the humidity, uh, and and for us over summer here in the Midwest. Uh, and up into Canada, we're looking at something around two tenths of an inch of water evaporation per day uh, for growing. And that is measured by that pan evaporation. Uh, we can estimate that, and that's about what your crop needs. We, uh, the NOAA maintains these weather stations around, they're a four foot diameter pan, and they measure how much water evaporates from that pan. Uh, in a year like this last year, though, where the temperatures are higher than average, then our water needs increase. And so this year we saw as much as a quarter of an inch a day, and that may not sound like much difference, but it's a lot, of thousands of gallons of water. And then when we go to the western United States where temperatures are higher, the daily evaporation may approach three-tenths of an inch. So that's one of the reasons that we can grow forage more efficiently here in the Midwest is we don't need as much water per day and therefore not as much water per ton of forage that we grow. And you see that in this graph here. Uh, the yield of alfalfa relative to the water that is used is always pretty linear. Um, in the west it's about five inches per ton. Here in the midwest it's two or three inches per ton. So again one of our advantages is not only do we generally not need the irrigation, but we can grow forage with less water than the west can. 
So water stress occurs when the soil moisture gets down to about 50% of soil capacity. The plant can't take all the water out. The stress results in reduced evapotranspiration and yield. The important thing to keep in mind is that this lost yield can never be made up. And this is what goes back to what I was talking about, the root growth. If you're dry during the first two weeks of growth, even if you get plenty of water from rain or from irrigation the last two weeks, you're not going to get as high a yield as if you had good soil moisture during the first two weeks. So as we're looking at our yields going on, uh, one of the questions that we have to ask is when does the rain occur and when does the growth start up? And if it is uh, following a, a rain that will have good soil moisture, we can expect pretty good yields. If the regrowth starts out dry, uh, we'll have less good yields. This is one of the reasons that a lot of farmers that take their first cutting early see a pretty good second cutting because we're oftentimes wet uh, through uh, the end of May. And those that take their first cutting in June tend to have a reduced second cutting because it tends to get drier in June. So all these things kind of fit together in terms of growth. Now what happens here? Moisture deficit uh, inhibits cell enlargement. It delays plant maturity. It reduces plant height. It increases leaf to stem ratio. And this is why forage quality usually goes up in alfalfa that is drought stressed. Uh, what we see is shorter plants, less stem, but the same amount of leaves. And in fact, uh, in years past, when we weren't paying as much attention to forage quality, we'd oftentimes see milk production in dairy cows increase during a drought. In the drought of 88, our milk per cow went up because we were feeding higher quality forage. Uh, we'll see whether or not that happens this year. Um, the moisture deficit will increase the stem nitrogen and decrease leaf nitrogen. So our total uh, nitrogen concentration of the alfalfa uh, will vary a little bit depending on the relative changes of those two. Um, and then generally, again, because we have less stem, we have less NDF. Drought stressed alfalfa will tend to flower a little bit earlier. Uh, but the other thing that we had this year is we have interactions with temperature. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, temperature, that NDF concentration increases with temperature. And so here's an example of some data where they harvested some high mountain hay, of which, uh, oh, those are wrong, it's not C, those would be Fahrenheit, 45 degrees Fahrenheit versus 70 degrees Fahrenheit overnight. And what you see in the NDF column is that that alfalfa harvested under the warmer night temperatures had four points more NDF. So temperature tends to increase NDF. This is one of the advantage for us is putting our first cutting for dairy because we have a, a little lower NDF. But the other thing that's most significant is that temperature reduces fiber digestibility. That forage, whether it's grass or alfalfa grown under cooler temperatures, is going to be more digestible than grass or alfalfa grown under hotter temperatures. And so in this table you can see under the NDF digestibility, and, and let's just take uh, either the, the grass or the stem, at uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the fiber digestibility was 22 percent and at 72 degrees Fahrenheit it was 42. Twice as much digestibility because of the cooler temperature and we saw the same difference there. Uh, I will say this is why the western dairies like the high mountain hay because it grows under cooler temperature and they know that even at the same NDF that fiber is more digestible and they'll get more milk. Well, what I'm suggesting this year is, is our first, this is why our first cutting is more digestible. Here's some data from my variety trials where I looked at the digestible fiber of every cutting. And you can see the purple is the first cutting, second and third are, are the brown. Uh, in every case but one, first cutting was more digestible fiber than any of the later cuttings in the season. And this is a typical trend. Uh, we have an advantage. Our first cutting grows under cool weather and, and therefore it is more digestible. 
The other thing to keep in mind is the temperature does affect time to flowering. The higher the temperature, the faster it flowers, and, and we saw some of that this year. So generally speaking, increasing the temperature, and we had way above average temperatures this year, decreases stem diameter, accelerates maturity, it increases lignification, it decreases plant height, it decreases the leaf to stem ratio and it decreases digestibility. So higher temperature is, is definitely a disadvantage to quality forage. <clears throat> the one thing that I want to just point out as a side here, that first point on stem diameter. You sometimes hear people talk about wanting a fine stem alfalfa. In fact, a fine stem alfalfa is usually lower quality. If you think about it, our biggest stem is on first cutting and that's the most digestible. And over summer, when the stem is smaller and finer, it's less digestible. And we, add, in fact, see the same thing when we compare varieties. Uh, a fine stem is not necessarily an indication of higher quality, as some people suggest. So alfalfa water use, just uh, a, a, a few thoughts. A mature, healthy, productive stand can better withstand drought. Younger stands... Are, have less well-developed crowns and root structures and are more prone to water stress and we'll talk about new seedings in a minute and in disease stands will suffer more. So one of the things that we should pay attention to is across all of the United States we have a problem with a disease called a phantomyces. It uh, restricts the root growth and you see the healthy plants on the left side of the picture you see the infected plants from the same field on the right side of the picture and then what we saw what we see normally is that the infected plants are a little stunted they're more yellow and the field doesn't yield as well in a year like this past year where we had the drought because the stunted plants had less of a root system in many cases they died as we see in the picture here so we're going to have lost some parts of stands the thing that I would suggest that we keep in mind is that we plant alfalfa with resistance to this aphanomyces disease and in doing so not only will we get higher yield but we'll be better able to survive droughty patterns such as we had this last year and frankly oftentimes we do have a dry month or two so keep uh, the need for aphanomyces resistance for alfalfa in mind everybody needs it the, the other thing that may happen, and I, it, how, the extent to which it happens uh, is something we'll have to wait and see, but new al young alfalfa plants are a little bit like that calf. If that calf gets diseased or anything happens to it, it becomes a runt and it never grows well again. And we see a little bit of that in alfalfa. You see the pictures there on the right that dry land plants with a stunted root system uh, didn't grow as well the next year as plants that had been irrigated and had received good moisture. And uh, I have seen some of this in the past. Uh, how much that's going to impact you is going to depend on exactly when the drought occurred, the extent to which it occurred. Uh, my recommendation for new seedings is always to take a first cutting off of it. We had good moisture and we probably should have left the new seedings alone the rest of the year because of the drought that we were having to try to minimize the impact on the root system so we can get good yields next year. So the other question that people are asking is the effect of drought on winter survival. Alfalfa stores roots for winter survival, for spring growth, and harvest regrowth. During the winter those crowns respire and use up some of that energy. Plants with fully charged crowns under normal conditions survive well. Those that are stressed in the fall will be more vulnerable to extremes. So where are we with our alfalfa? Well we have two conflicting uh, things going on at this point. Uh, one is, in many cases, we didn't get the growth and we didn't fully charge those roots of carbohydrates. But the other thing is, is that a dry soil going into the winter enhances winter survival. Cold, wet soils get colder, wet soils uh, have more disease, and so we see more stand thinning. 
in terms of how the alfalfa will survive the winter, I think it's going to depend a lot on the winter we have. If we get good snow cover and it stays there, I think we're going to be okay. On the other hand, the plants are a little bit weaker than we'd like to see. And if we have an open winter such that those plants green up and freeze back two or three times, we could have some difficulty next spring. So I think that's something we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed on. It could go either way depending on our snow cover pattern this winter. Uh, fall management, of course, is very important. Uh, <clears throat> and there's two aspects to this. I generally recommended that we cut in the fall if we had enough hay to cut because we all needed it. Uh, it does, of course, put a little bit of stress on it, but the other main thing is to make sure that we have potassium on those alfalfa plants. Potassium is absolutely necessary for winter survival. And in fact, I'll say it now and probably again, that if you have not replaced the potassium that was removed this past summer, I'd get out right now and do it. It's not too late until after the ground is frozen. And uh, But a little bit of potassium will truly affect winter survival of the alfalfa. The pattern that we see with the root reserves is as shown in the blue line on the graph. Um, whenever you cut alfalfa, we start at the left side. The root carbohydrates decline as the plant begins to regrow, and then as it gets over six inches, it puts them back. So if we cut it full bloom, the blue line, you can see we put a lot of carbohydrates back in. If we cut at the bud stage, which we need to do for dairy quality hay, we are stressing that plant. This is the reason why the recommendations for managing our alfalfa are to take first cutting for dairy quality uh, and then to let one or if we took uh, more than four cuttings, possibly two cuttings go to 10% bloom to rebuild stand condition. Those cuttings over summer that we let go to 10% bloom can uh, be heifer feed, uh, they're also higher quality at the later stages of maturity. But the point being that those farmers that cut alfalfa at the bud stage every cutting are really putting tremendous stress on that stand and we're going to always see significant thinning in those stands and enhanced winter kill. So um, frequent cutting reduces root diameter, cutting at mature stages reduces stored products and leaves the plants, each successive cutting results in increased detrimental effects. And so again, our recommendation was is that basically every other cutting should be let to go to 10% bloom. And by doing so, you can get some cuttings of your dairy quality hay, and you can get some cuttings, uh, you can still uh, have two that are going to 10% bloom to rebuild that stand condition. Now, the question I always got was, what about harvesting the alfalfa? Well, the, the first consideration is that uh, when we have drought-stressed alfalfa, um, we should harvest only when it's economic. Harvesting it just because it's short and flowering does not make it regrow anymore. In fact, I saw an awful lot of what I'd call therapeutic mowing where people felt like they needed to do something they were out mowing alfalfa that they couldn't har that was too little to harvest and uh, again there's just no reason to do that so our recommendation is generally if the stand is over 10 inches tall there's enough to be economic to harvest uh, in drought stressed wait till flowering it'll still be very high quality let the plants get close to a hundred percent bloom and then mow at a normal height. If the stand is less than 10 inches tall, don't cut. Uh, it's hard, hardly enough to rake. It's, uh, it's difficult to make hay off of it. It certainly is not economic. You are causing damage to the field by driving over it. You're wasting fuel and labor. Uh, what we will see with those short stands is, is that once they flower, uh, they'll put out new shoots, uh, the regrowth will come right through and produce a good cutting. Leaving that old cutting there won't have a very big impact on quality because there isn't much tonnage there. So uh, generally speaking, more than 10 inches is probably economic to harvest, do so. Less than 10 inches, it's probably not and shouldn't. The main thing that we saw this year 
is that we certainly do need to continue to scout and control potato leaf hopper, army worm, and other insects because those will keep the regrowth from coming back. That's a hard thing to continue uh, doing the pest management on these fields when they're not growing, but we're trying to think uh, a month down the road. We're hoping that we'll get some rain in the interim. It's absolutely important to control the insects and diseases. And again, because of the warm year, they were worse than we've ever seen with a greater variety of insects than we've ever seen across the northern states. <clears throat> Now, with regard to new seedings, um, drought stressed new seedings should not be harvested during the season as a rule of thumb. This past year we had again good moisture in April and May and so for those that were seeded early we could have taken a cutting at 60 days and a lot of people did and that was appropriate. At that point when there was little moisture for regrowth we should have left the fields alone, let them flower uh, again, these new seedlings don't have the root system of the established stand and, and they're uh, particularly susceptible to drought and as I suggested, um, if we stunt them too much they'll be like that runt calf and never do well in future years. I do think it was appropriate and uh, that a late fall cutting be taken. And you know, uh, those late fall cuttings can be taken any time after it won't regrow. We don't need to wait for a killing frost. Uh, late fall cutting could even be taken now. It's just difficult to get it to dry. So drought effects on the stand. Uh, the growth of new shoots is largely depends on the, the root reserves. The more you got, the more shoots you get. That's why drought sta droughty stands are thin. Uh, frequent early cutting causes yellowing. Uh, depleted soil reserves may contribute to winter kill or winter injury and I went through this earlier dry soil generally survives better. I'm going to skip that and go on. Um, let's go on to the next topic that uh, a lot of uh, individuals uh, because they took their corn silage off early from the drought looked at planting a second crop in that field to attempt to increase their fall forage supply. Um, there were a number of choices that were out there. I guess I'd ask the audience if any of them seeded any of the choices on this graph. Well, very good, Dan. I think uh, our polls, uh, Jim, are our polls open? Okay, yeah. polls are open, and I uh, I don't see a vote count uh, yet. Oh, Jim just brought it up here at this point. Uh, we are uh, we're off and running here. Yeah, the polls have been open now for about thirty seconds, and uh, we're going. Those of you that are advisors, you can reflect uh, what you saw your clients uh, or customers do out there. Also, yeah, it's, it's pr pretty amazing to 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 see uh, what's coming up here. Uh, I find it interesting because uh, Dan, we we had a lot of interest in in, in uh, alternative forages. In um, obviously, when our corn silage got hurt so very very bad. Yeah, we are okay. We got, we're going to keep it open for just another couple seconds. Vote, come quickly, come quickly, come on, you Republicans, you're you're holding holding us back. Uh, must be let's go voter fatigue after the couple weeks last week. So. Yeah, let's go ahead and close it and let's show the results. Dan, you may want to uh, comment on the results. Uh, can you give me the numbers? I don't see the. Graph. Okay, well, uh, sorghum sedan grass, we're at 22%. Sorghum sedan grass, oats, 31%. Oats with peas, 16%. Other small grain, 31%. Zero on the corn. So uh, what does that mean, Dan? <laughs> means a lot of people didn't make the best choice. <laughs> um, let me just go down quickly through uh, through a few of these and, and, and kind of give you our impression is is what we think. Uh, there was uh, after the corn silage some interest in planting sorghum sedan grass. I would suggest that that's a bad choice. If we can get sorghum sedan grass in uh, in uh, in June we'll have adequate temperatures and we'll get some tonnage off that particularly as we go south out of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Uh, we have to remember that sorghum sedan grass really requires daily high temperatures of 80 degrees or more for good growth. And so, um, you know, when I had people asking me on the 1st of August, what should I plant, I'd say, well, how many 80 degree days do you have left? And most people realize that our average temperatures fall below 80, uh, usually sometime after the 1st of August. And so 
so the story with oats is uh, a late, if we're going to plant around September 1 or later, then the maturity of the variety doesn't make too much difference. I, I put up a set of instructions there that focus on forage. Um, oats with peas, we, we should remember that adding peas to oats increases the cost of the seed quite a bit. It will improve the palatability and, and make it a dairy cow feed, whereas pure oats is marginal. Uh, but uh, all we're looking for peas is really to improve palatability. So I recommend adding a minimal amount to two to three bushels of oats. Um, Here's an example of the question then becomes when to cut the stuff and uh, the longer you wait the more tonnage you get. Uh, three weeks waiting here from some studies in central Wisconsin gave us an extra ton of forage. Uh, the question we have to ask is uh, and that is is the quality and if we're cutting for dairy we're of course talking about the wanting to cut at the boot stage. If we're cutting for heifers or dry cows we'd probably just wait until close to a frost to harvest it. The, uh, the thing that happened was is that we had so much interest that we frankly ran out of oat seed. And, uh, and so then we shifted to other small grains, triticale, barley, and rye. Um, some barleys of triticale will yield well in the fall. Uh, triticale, barley, and rye will all survive the winter. And, uh, and so then they tend to grow a little bit less in the fall. Uh, but in many cases, since we couldn't get oats, that was our choice. Uh, if we can't find winter rye, winter triticale, or, uh, or wheat are the forage option. But do remember, if you plan on growing that in the spring, it's going to delay your planting of corn or some other alternative forage. And so you have to balance, uh, are you going to get more from letting that fall plant and small grain grow, or are you going to get more from starting over? and you have to decide where you're at. Ryegrass is another choice that could have been planted. It's a little bit less yield than oats in the fall. It's not as drought tolerant and uh, generally it won't survive the winter. With good snow cover it will, but usually it, it doesn't. So um, it would have been a choice for fall forage in areas if we had good moisture, which we oftentimes didn't. Oats is much more drought tolerant and would have produced more yield with the stress that we had. The, um, the one that most people don't think about, and, and I might mention the other thing with all of these small grains, and it's important I think to think about this for next year, is that the herbicides you put on the corn in many cases limited what you could plant after the corn. Uh, in, in a number of the herbicides you can't plant small grains for 18 months. So that really knocked out planting anything after that. However, you could come back after the corn silage was taken off and replant corn. And our data would suggest that the highest tonnage crop up until August 1 is corn. It'll yield more than the oats, it'll yield more than the triticale barley. Uh, and so the, the approach should be to plant the corn, at a normal planting rate to let it grow till a killing frost and then or thereabouts and then mow it and run it through the conditioner. It'll have a small stem so you can condition it, wilt it, and you can make silage out of it or uh, possibly even bale it if the stems are small enough. But, uh, but corn is a choice that we should consider. The main thing that we have to pay attention to of course is uh, is whether or not we planted a GMO and the legality of what we would plant following it. Uh, we're looking at the forage so there's no reason for a high quality variety. I'd go get the cheapest seed I can uh, and then uh, and, and plant it in those fields but clearly uh, corn is our highest yielding crop and is one we normally don't think of for a late summer planting but uh, mowed and conditioned it'll dry down and it's a high quality forage uh, prior to pollination. So those are the choices that we had last fall. What I'd like to do is uh, look with the uh, audience in terms of what our forage supply is. Uh, how many are going to need to buy more or reduce our animal numbers? How many are adequate with the supplemental forages they've grown? How many got enough corn silage in alfalfa? and how many have a little extra? 
Very good, Dan. The, the polls are open, and uh, we're catching on here pretty fast. I tell you, we've uh, we're uh, we're up uh, to 35 percent in 30 seconds, so we're zipping zipping right along here. And uh, we will uh, close the polls probably in about another uh, five or six seconds. So let's uh, go ahead and vote here, folks. We're getting getting pretty close to uh, to a record turnout here. Much 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 like our presidential vote here, we're going to get pretty close to two thirds of the vote here when we uh, we shut her off here. And uh, let's go ahead and shut it off. And uh, again, Dan, I can read the numbers to you. Uh, I assume you're not seeing these. Please. Okay, so the the need to buy more uh, more forage or reduce animal numbers a third of the people thirty three percent, twenty five percent said adequate uh, adequate supply with supplemental forage grown, another twenty percent said adequate with corn silage and alfalfa that are growing, and uh, twenty about a quarter twenty three percent said they've got some reserve. So uh, it's it's almost it's almost uh, an, an even split, Dan. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> that's good because. Uh, for those that are going to need forage, uh, the more farmers that have a little to sell or share with them, uh, we're always willing to help each other and, and certainly the better off that we will be. Um, let's, let's think a little bit about, I'm trying to get my slide to move. I can't get off the poll slide. Let's see if, there we go. Um, let's think a little bit about what we're going to do through this fall and winter and, and into next year. Um, uh, Steve, I did mention that uh, website with our pricing. Here is the data from November 2nd, about a week ago. Uh, we have the website, and it is at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, we have a county agent who uh, checks with hay dealers, who monitors the prices in tested hay auctions, and then builds a summary table once a week. Usually the new table goes up on Friday and uh, we look at the price and what I want to show there I think there's two things first is there's quite a range <laughs> if you look at the minimum and maximum columns it's uh, 100 to 200 dollars a ton in many cases so uh, it does pay to shop around uh, but the other thing is if we look at our prices we're running about 250 to 270 for prime dairy hay uh, as of November 2nd about two hundred dollars a ton for one twenty five to one hundred and fifty RFQ and then uh, the grade two which would be for dry cows and heifers is uh, running uh, OL it's 106 uh, large square bales are 180 uh, what a, there, there's a couple things I think worth pointing out first is is to pay attention to bale form if you note, I mean, the dairy industry prefers the large square bales, and those are running considerably more for a ton of hay than any other form of hay here in the Midwest. So if you have to buy hay, it might be worthwhile to think about, can you use round bales particularly or some other form and save yourself from, uh, uh, you know, 30 to $50 a ton on the hay. Uh, bale form makes a difference in terms of the price of hay. So what can you do now? Well, the first is certainly inventory feedstuffs and know where you are. Um, and I just can't stress this enough, uh, uh, particularly that third of you that are short on hay, find out how much short. Uh, make a plan right now to decide what you're going to do to, to meet that shortage. And, and one of the simple things might be to reduce your herd size. Uh, and the sooner you make that decision, the less hay you'll use and the more that you'll have available for the remaining animals. So make your cull decisions early. Then the other thing is uh, let's look towards next year. Um, as I said earlier in this talk, if, if you didn't apply enough potassium on your alfalfa fields to replace what you removed, it's not too late to get out there and get it on yet, and I would certainly do that. Uh, it'll improve your winter survival. It'll improve the growth and tonnage of first cutting. Add 25 pounds of sulfur fertilizing this fall. It could be 15, but 15 to 25. Um, a lot of our fields are short on sulfur, and we haven't been putting enough of that on. And again, to put some on with the potassium this fall uh, will enhance your spring growth. So we're looking at setting our field up that we can get as much tonnage as possible in the spring. 
uh, graze any stockpile forage, uh, and this could be even grass waterways, things like that that we have. And uh, let your heifers and dry cows get out and uh, and graze some of these areas if they can. For some of us, it's not practical because of fencing limitations, but a lot of us have some areas with some forage that. Uh, you know, late in the season, this dry brown stuff is fairly high quality. It can still be 15 to 20 percent protein it, because it's not stemmy anymore. It's only leaves. And if you have the cattle graze the leaves, you can have a relatively uh, low fiber, high protein forage for those animals. Uh, graze corn stalks. Um, and there's been... Uh, a lot of people do that all the time, but this is especially an important year. Uh, or a lot of people are bailing them and, and feeding them as a, as a hay or bedding. Uh, in addition, uh, there's been some effort around talk about treating the corn stalks with hydroxide, uh, calcium hydroxide, uh, you can use sodium hydroxide, whatever, to improve the fiber digestibility. Uh, for a lot of farmers, a simpler and more practical approach may be to use anhydrous ammonia. Simply uh, make a stack of the bales, cover it with plastic, and pump some anhydrous in there. Uh, we do have a fact sheet up on our Team Forage website to talk about doing that. Um, it will improve the crude protein content of the corn stalks, perhaps make it adequate for dry cows. Uh, it will improve the fiber digestibility and reduce the grain that is needed. The, the last thing that we can do in terms of helping us through the winter is, is certainly to feed efficiently. And uh, when I look at uh, a lot of round bales, the way they're fed, if you look at the picture on the left with animals led up to a bale, they are wasting 40% of that hay, 40%. Uh, a bale feeder like on the right there will reduce that loss to about 15. But if we go to a cradle feeder, uh, like shown in the middle here, where the bale is, is in that rack in the middle, a cow has to reach into the baler, into the feeder, and twist its head, and it can't just back straight out and pull a chunk of hay out onto the ground like it could have done in that round feeder. Also, the hay that drops down is still inside the feeder, is still eligible for eating. Uh, we can go from that round bale feeder that I showed you to this cradle feeder. We can reduce our losses uh, down to 5 or 10 percent. Um, you know, I looked at some of this right now with the cost, days to recover the cost of the feeder. And I was figuring $200 a ton hay, 20 animals consuming 20 pounds a day and just looking at feeding efficiency losses. And those round feeders uh, are in that three to four hundred dollar range and you can see that uh, right now you can with two hundred dollar hay you can recover that cost in thirteen to fifteen days. Uh, as we go towards the cradle feeder they're more expensive up in that seven hundred dollar range and again at two hundred dollar a ton hay and it's fifty percent more than that right now but at two hundred dollar a ton hay it took about a month to recover that cost so i would strongly urge everybody to think about getting quality bale feeders if they're going to feed large square bales to improve their feeding efficiency it'll save them money they'll recover the cost every month of the feeder but more importantly it'll stretch their hay supply and help their inventory carry through into the spring. Now, um, so that that's really what we're talking about is what we can do right now uh, to uh, try to help get us through the winter. What should we do in the spring of 2013? One is to evaluate stands and replant if necessary. Um, some farmers have thin alfalfa stands that were planted this last year just because of the drought. If your plant stand in the spring isn't uh, 15 to 20 plants per square foot, I would disc it and reseed immediately. The sooner you make that decision, the better. You could also seed two pounds of Italian ryegrass with the alfalfa, and then you'll get some forage early and you'll get your alfalfa stand back. Interseeding to thicken those thinned alfalfa stands never produces a satisfactory stand. Um, if you're going to plant some alfalfa, plant with oats or ryegrass as a cover crop to increase early season yields. Because a lot of us are going to 
need forage and it's not a question of total tonnage for the year it's a question of needing forage at the time that first cutting is due which the oats or the ryegrass will give us forage at that point. Prepare to fertilize the alfalfa after first cutting. Again, if you don't put on the full amount this year, but even if you do, consider uh, the general time to fertilize alfalfa is after first cutting and after third. And then maximize pasture use. Uh, fertilize and allocate forage. Uh, if we use some kind of temporary fencing in these pastures, uh, we can get up to 60 or 70 percent of the forage consumed by the animal. If we simply turn animals out into a large area, we only get about half that consumption of forages. So we are really increasing our forage utilization by giving the animals a little bit at a time. And with that, uh, I think I'll, I'll end my presentation and uh, we'll see if we have some questions. Well, Steve, I'll turn this back to you now. We do have a okay. bunch of questions here, Dan, so hang tight. And, Steve, yeah. maybe you want to comment on uh, I do what's... want to make a few comments and some announcements here, and we'll give Dan a chance to uh, uh, catch his breath a minute and uh, thank him, first of all, for a great presentation. Uh, Dan, uh, lots of very interesting things. Uh, you, uh, you addressed some preconceived notions I think some of us have that uh, weren't quite right. It's good. Glad to have you... Uh, shed some new light on some some uh, some of those uh, factors, but we do appreciate your your great job, and and again it gives us a chance to thank the uh, folks at Muriel and their Best in Class Dairies program uh, for their sponsorship uh, today. Uh, those of you who are familiar with our webinar series know that uh, that you'll be able you and your coworkers will be able to view Dan's. Uh, uh, webinar on our website, archived webinars, and all of the ones that we've had before will be there. Just go to hordes.com and, and uh, well, I, um, Steve, uh, we we lost you there for a minute. Uh, am I? Can you hear me, Jim? You can hear me. Uh, that's uh, that's good. We'll uh, okay. Uh, am I back now? Yep, you're back. Am I back? Okay, great. Um, so the webinars uh, can be viewed in, in our archives. Those of you that uh, listened in today, we appreciate your participation. You'll be getting a, a very brief and uh, uh, survey here in a couple of days that will help us uh, direct our webinar program in the future. And I tell people it's kind of an interesting um, web or survey to respond to because you know how others did just as soon as the minute that you uh, answer the questions uh, that are there. Uh, looking ahead a bit uh, in our webinar series, um, the next Words Dairyman webinar, uh, part of our regular set scheduled series, will be December 10th. Tom Olberg from Diamond B will be talking about consistent, uh, uh, efficient TMR feeding, and Coon North America is going to be the sponsor of that. There also is a special webinar coming up. Uh, hey, Dan, from Dan, today. Dan, can you click back once? Uh, so you're with uh, Steve. Dan, can you click back one, one PowerPoint? There, yeah, we there we go, and there's that special webinar next Monday at noon Central Time, and uh, it's going to be brought by Pfizer Animal Health, and it's going to be on heifer or young stock reproduction uh, programs. Dr. John Lee uh, with Pfizer Animal Health is going to be conducting that. Now that you will, those of you who have been subscribing to our series will receive a notice of that, and then there'll be with that a link uh, for that to sign up for that webinar. Uh, that's coming a week from today, and otherwise the onhords.com repro-webinar website that you see there will get you there. So with those comments, uh, Mike, uh, why don't you see uh, what questions we might have for Dan? Yeah, very good, Dan. Get ready. You, uh, we, we've got a number of them here at this point. Uh, uh, let's go to the top one, Jim, and uh, if you can just move that up, we'll, we'll, we'll take them as they came in. A uh, question from Eastern Canada. Uh, they, they said, generally, uh, uh, the new seedings are very weedy this summer. Uh, Dan, how will this affect next year's yield? The, generally speaking, we look at the weeds, if they occurred in the first 60 days, will cause stand thinning. So I would go back to uh, looking at plant counts, which you could even do yet if you don't have snow. Um, and, and do you have 20 plants per square foot? 
if you do, uh, we'd like to see 30, but we can get by with 20. But you, you're in good shape. If you're down around 8 or 10, it's going to be a thin stand. It's going to be low yielding, and it's going to you're going to have continued weed problems. Okay, Dan, can you click uh, to our sponsors so we make sure we have one more where you were once before? If you can click one more slide, that would be good. We certainly want to thank our sponsors. Without them, there wouldn't be one, uh, these webinars. Number Another question, Dan, for you, for mixed stands. Are grasses like a tall fescue and orchard grass detrimental to alfalfa establishment and growth? Uh, no, in fact, uh, there's a good place for alfalfa grass mixtures. Uh, Generally, and, and in particular, we're recommending it in dairies that are feeding a lot of corn silage because they have a lot of non-fibrous carbohydrate in the ration. Putting some grass in with the alfalfa gives us a good digestible fiber source, but reduce non-fibrous carbohydrate. Uh, the key thing is to keep a lowered seeding rate. We'd like to see about 30 or 40 percent grass and the remainder alfalfa as you harvest it. Uh, that generally means that you want to seed something about 20 or 30 percent grass with the alfalfa on a weight basis uh, so that you don't get a preponderance of grass if you happen to have a cool wet spring. Well, Dan, your next question follows right into it, and it says, so what's your opinion of pure grasses, of pure grass fields in dairy farms because the farmers are getting tired of dealing with alfalfa winter kill? Uh, well, several things. First off, uh, pure grass stands uh, can work well. Um, as Mike, as, as you and others can say, when we go to pure grass, we do have to pay attention to having uh, low enough NDF to still get the, the intake that we want to the animals. Uh, the, the challenge with pure grass stands is in a year like last year, the grass really gets hurt worse by the drought than the alfalfa does and so our yield goes down. We also in pure grass stands need to supply nitrogen. Now maybe you have enough manure to do that but maybe not. Uh, I think the the issue with winter kill and alfalfa is, is one, make sure you have a good soil fertility level including potassium. Two, plant a winter hardy variety with a winter survival score of two or less and then three, we should only think about keeping the alfalfa stands for three years and then turning it over and rotating it. And if we do all those things, uh, we'll minimize the winter kill issues that we have. Okay, uh, next question. Um, are there climatic restrictions on growing corn in the fall as a forage crop? Make sense to you? I'm not sure exactly what the person has in mind, but basically no. corn will grow under cool weather. And so uh, it will grow right up till a frost. It'll grow during those falls uh, when we have maybe our 60 or 70 degree days and close to freezing nights. Uh, we don't have to worry about nitrate toxicity or or any kind of toxic compounds unless we have put uh, uh, an excessive amount of nitrogen fertilizer on. So uh, the short answer is no. There's really no environmental restrictions for growing corn in the fall. The main thing is it's going to be too high a moisture to ensile, so we have to wilt it somehow or let it freeze and dry down a little bit before we can ensile it. Okay, Dan, the, uh, a related question will be uh, how cold before it will the, uh, the, the small grains are going to be damaged? In other words, how, how cold does it get? We got 27 degrees here at Champaign, and I have a farmer who's got a thousand acres of small grain out there. Uh, it, did, did he just buy the bullet tonight, uh, last night, or is he going to be okay? The, uh, the, the killing frost is a difficult thing to, to talk about because it depends on how cold it gets. It depends on how many hours it lasts. It depends on if there was a breeze that moved the air. If, if it's perfectly still and you've got that oat canopy and it will insulate itself from the soil. And so it takes a colder temperature to kill it on a still night than it does on a windy night. Uh, the long and the short is he's likely to see some leaf burn at 27. Once we get down to 24 or 25, we can be fairly sure that most of that oats has been uh, killed. and 
we should think about it drying down and starting to harvest it as the moisture content gets appropriate. Excellent answer. Uh, next question, do you think next year's crop uh, should include a drought resistant varieties or crops like sorghum to try to ensure more forage in the uh, forage bank on the farm? Well, you're asking me to predict the weather, Mike. <laughs> And the one thing I know is that I can't do that. Um, if we have an average year, corn is by far the best crop to grow. Most tonnage uh, and some of these varieties are getting pretty drought tolerant. If uh, an alfalfa equally is, is drought tolerant. Uh, if we have above average temperatures like we did this last year and drought, then obviously then sorghum becomes a little bit more preferred. But but remember, sorghum would not be preferred if we have something below average in temperatures. So I guess uh, as a grower, you have to decide what you think the growing season is going to be like. And if you think it's going to be average or near to average or cool, corn's the best crop. If you think we're going to have another drought and above average temperatures, then sorghum becomes a little bit more appealing. Well, you aren't going to get off quite that easy. You're the expert now. Would uh, uh, I'm asking you, uh, would you put 25% into a risk category just to in case it happens, uh, you know what I'm saying? Or do you wait until see what the growing season in May is and then decide what to do with sorghums, for example? Well, I think, yes. First off, I'd wait till spring to make the decision, see what our soil moisture is like. Um, I'm going to say, though, generally... From the northern half of Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana north, corn is always going to be the better choice. In the southern portions of those states and to the south, then I'd probably consider putting a, a percentage of sorghum in, yes. Very good. Ah, here we go. Uh, is it too late to fertilize your hay, I assume it's alfalfa, if the ground is frozen but probably will thaw out in the next couple of days? <laughs> um, the, the situation is we're talking about potassium which is very soluble and will move into the soil with as little as half an inch of rain. If the individual feels that we'll get half an inch of rain yet this fall then I would still fertilize. Um, I need to know where we are. I mean frankly um, where I am we're right on the fringe Mike. Where you are you might have a week or two yet. Okay. Very good answer. Okay, to your knowledge, is it possible to get the same yield with clover than with alfalfa in a mixed stand? Again, it depends on where you are. The further north we go, the better advantage the clover has. So if we, uh, when we run our trials over the years, uh, say from Minneapolis uh, north in Minnesota, Wisconsin, if you draw that line across Michigan, uh, clover will yield as well as or better than alfalfa from Minneapolis south then because we tend to have warmer temperatures then alfalfa is favored and uh, clover might do as well for one year but it won't do as well in the second year as alfalfa will. I guess, Dan, uh, the, the comment I would ask you, and that is, it sounds like it's a it's a temperature effect. I thought maybe it was a soil effect. Uh, is it pretty much temperature driven, that answer? It's pretty much temperature driven uh, because um, the optimum growth temperature for alfalfa is around 85 to 80, uh, around 80 to 85. The optimum temperature for clover is around 80. So that, you know, five degree temperature difference makes a lot of difference in in the tonnage that you'll get. And what you have to look at is what's your probability of above average of above 80 temperatures versus below 80 daily high temperatures. Uh, one last question, and, and that is, we, we know on the corn side of the equation there's some drought resistance coming in. Is there any research on the alfalfa or clover uh, aspects or grass side, uh, the, the non-corn side, for drought resistance in terms of genetic uh, changes in, in the, the plant itself? Uh, yes, we're seeing a lot of work on alfalfa and drought tolerance, and I think we'll see some germplasms that are much more drought tolerant down the road. Uh, that is one thing that I would point out, is that alfalfa is far more drought tolerant than any of the clovers. 
So if you're worried about drought, then alfalfa is a legume of choice. If you're in a good moisture situation, then the temperature comments that I made in the last answer are appropriate. Well, it's uh, 1 o'clock, Dan, and you've done Yeoman's job. First of all, thanks yes. very much for keeping us on schedule and uh, fielding all these questions here. And, uh, Steve, I'll turn it back to you if you okay. have any closing Just comments. We'll wrap, we'll wrap things up here. I want to add uh, uh, to you, Dan, and, uh, uh, thanks uh, for a wonderful job. Uh, good job answering some interesting questions, and uh, uh, your presentation was full of, a, I thought, just some very interesting and uh, useful uh, data and observations, and we appreciate that, and we appreciate Muriel's sponsorship of the webinar today. We also appreciate Mike Hutchins, our co-host down there at the University of Illinois, and, and his partner, Jim Baltz. Thank you so much for your efforts, and uh, just reminding everyone that uh, our December webinar, Tom Olberg from Diamond V will be talking about consistent, efficient TMR feeding. It's going to be brought to us by Coon North America. And a special webinar that you will be uh, receiving an email on uh, here in the next few days, a week from today, next Monday, November 19th, uh, Pfizer Animal Health will be sponsoring uh, a special webinar on uh, managing the reproductive uh, program for heifers. And Dr. John Lee is going to be the resource person on that, and uh, we look forward to, to uh, having that be a part of our webinar uh, offerings as well. So again, thanks to all of you who have joined us. Uh, we appreciate your participation and hope you can be back with us again on future webinars. That's all.